Hey guys, Henrik Lundqvist here at Club 30. We're back. We are back. Jay Lydell, how are we feeling today? Feeling really good. I think that um, I think that Club 30 members are going to love this one. Yeah, we're talking to someone today that um, I think I've known this guy for, I'm going to guess now, 12 years, something like that. Um, but he incredible career. Um, we might as well just say it. It's John Macaro, great tennis player. He, he, uh, his interest for music. That's where we connected actually at a concert back in the day. And we started talking about sports and music and then one thing led to another. And then we started jamming together and a couple of charity events and, and, uh, just had a lot of fun to get to know John over the years. So I'm, I'm really excited to have him on the show today. Yeah, I think um, I had never met him, but what I mean, uh, disregarding anything you know uh, about Googling John McEnroe, and it's easy to find like, these sizzle bites and how he was hot-headed or outspoken. I mean, the guy is true to himself, and that's the most important thing about making it in New York is understanding who you are and what you're good at and not making that many apologies for when you let people who don't have the same worldview uh, uh, disagree with you. So I, I thought that that was, that was uh, an amazing conversation. And here it is, guys. John Macaro at Club 30. Enjoy the show. He's a seven-time Grand Slam winner. He's the only player to be ranked number one, singles and doubles at the same time. Welcome to Club 30, tennis legend, Hall of Famer, and rock and roll lover, John McEnroe. Drum roll, right? Drum roll. You're a rocker. I mean, there should be a drum roll. (laughs) We got a guitar. That's about it. Do that next season. (laughs) But you just came back from Florida. Uh, We actually watched you play pickleball. It was Mm. a pickleball slam. Yes, uh, and I also heard your comments going into the the mm-hmm. weekend. You're not a huge fan of pickleball, no. like. Well, I mean, I would compare it to I, I'm trying to think of hockey, but uh, football that comes to mind, like NFL football. It's like playing arena football. You know, it's like one third or one quarter the size. Um, so it's an extremely, in my view, I mean, I'm biased. I'm a tennis guy, but it's yeah. a poor man's game. You know, the uh, the level that you need in tennis, you know, is, is I, at least everyone, someone's got to be the best at whatever they do, but it's a lot easier to be a lot closer. You know, it's an equalizer. So the reason I don't think it completely sucks is that I get to play with my friends uh, and they like it and they think they can beat me and they forget that I know a little something about the court, like the geometry of a sure. court, even if it's smaller. Yeah. But, you know, I don't like what it does to my body. You know, like the day after I played the pickleball <laughs> slam, <laughs> the back wasn't feeling too good. I'm not a spring chicken anymore. I know this is hard to believe t- telling Very all hard. this hair, the color of it. <laughs> but um, so I realized before, like a week or so before, I'm like, oh, my God, I haven't really been playing at all. <laughs> Hopefully they're not playing. Then all of a sudden I hear Agassi and Roddick have been practicing and Agassi has been with the pickleball pros. And I'm like, oh, great. And then the days leading up to it, Michael and I got thrashed by a couple people. I'm like, who the hell are these people type of thing? You know, yeah. like, you know, go to a local club and get your ass kicked. <laughs> Wasn't too into that. So that's also like a wake up call because I figured like at least I've been out there and I mean, not too much now, admittedly out there, you know, and with a lot of people. I mean, for a pickleball match, I think there was like 4000 people and we're yeah. on ESPN. So I'm like yeah. basically shitting in my pants. Uh, you know, <laughs> Don't make a fool out of yourself. <laughs> but I have just have to say, uh, uh, tell you a funny story. I was out at Randall's Island last week. I was talking to your brother, Patrick. And we were talking about this event, and he said, well, John's going to be very honest about how he feels about pickleball. Um, and as we're talking, his phone vibrates, and he gets a notification from ESPN where you said, pickleball makes me want to throw up. So it was kind of <laughs> funny as we're talking about it, the statement came up. But I wonder, after this week, and has it changed your mind a little bit? Well, or? what I'm hopeful for, actually, is that I did have a couple of friends who've come up to me and said to me, they actually like tennis more because they understand like sort of what it takes in a way they're on using a racket. And so then they're like, Oh, that's made me more interested 
in tennis. So I was hoping it will be a win-win because yeah. from what I'm hearing, the fastest growing sport in America, pickleball, I'm like, give me a break. And also, like, I don't know, the name is pretty bad to begin with. Who, who yeah. named it? Some guy that owned a pickle company or, or you know, it's, <laughs> or, I don't know. And the rules, there's, you know, you can't serve overhand. You know, there's a lot of things that are sort of, to me, equalizers. But, you know, I found, because I was filming a tennis thing yesterday, that originally a serve was meant to be service the ball and just get it into your opponent, you know, nicely. Serve underhand. Hmm. Yeah. Well, so maybe pickleball stole something from me. But all that matters is I beat Agassi. Okay. That was a big that. win. That was yeah. a big win. You it's a big win. Well. Because early on, he was you know, up on me pretty good. And he's like, all right, John, how you feeling over there? You feeling a little tight? Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, I felt like going, yes, I, I am feeling tight. But at the last, you know, when there was like, I forgot this, 15, 13, and I was a point or so from victory. How you feeling now? <laughs> you know, she was on the other foot a little bit, okay? You're, you're losing to the old man here. So you well, took a sport that was designed to be non-competitive and made it really competitive, which is well, like, all that matters. Well, that's, that's what all competitors do. Yeah. You know, all athletes do that. I think they find a way to make anything competitive yes. in a way. And so I've been actually spending the last 20, 30 years, if not more, trying to tone down the competitiveness a little bit. But yeah. let, let's get into that a little bit. Like tennis, I, I've been running into you a couple of times on, on your tennis academy out on Randall's Island. I love when uh, you come out. I love playing and I've seen you out there. And, and so how often are you on the tennis court today? Well, as often as I can be out there, because I, I do love hitting with the kids and, you know, hopefully showing them who's boss. Because, you know, they don't basically don't know what the hell they're doing. And I try to, you know, but they hit the ball like twice as hard as I hit it, right? So, you know, to show the little finesse, a little mental thought process that goes into the sport may come in handy when you really need it, like when you compete. Mm. And it's not just about who hits it the hardest. So to me, um, I'd like to get out there. Uh, the body doesn't cooperate, you know, as well. I've torn my meniscus a couple times the last five years. Um, Fortunately, I've been able to rehab through like a couple shots and rehab, and I've never had a surgery, so my body's been pretty good to me. But, you know, I hit the big 6-0 four years ago, oh, Henrik. Yeah. You know, you're looking right? incredible, but, you know, you're still quite a bit younger than me. <laughs> so it's not – it doesn't get any easier. But, like, I will go out there – if I'm here a couple of weeks, I'll go out, you know, five days a week. I love to go out. To and Randall's do you coach Island. the kids? I try to, but they don't seem to listen very much. You know, <laughs> I don't. What do I know? He, he played with a wood racket. <laughs> That's not just um, a tennis thing. You know, it's it. like yeah. uh, I don't know if it's the same in hockey. Uh, uh, if they pay any attention, well, it still seems no. to be pretty close to the same. But um, in tennis, it has changed quite a bit. Yeah. The surface, the strings, the balls, the this, the that. Players have gotten a lot bigger. I'd like to think the kids listen. You know, hopefully I'm sort of what I, my goal is to be like the inspirational leader. That's what I want to do. I want to mm. sort of get that extra five, 10% out of them. And that could be the difference between getting into a great college, a scholarship, possibly making it in the pro circuit, possibly doing something big mm -hmm. and being an also ran. That's what parents and the kids don't understand. You know, unfortunately the, the kids are, easier to teach than the parents you know the parents are telling me how to you know how it's done now i'm like excuse me yeah. <laughs> and is, is that extra five to ten is that uh, given these I'm, I'm assuming these kids are are pretty gifted physically is it is it uh, predominantly that mental edge or i believe so yeah you know but obviously uh we're looking for the next you know superior athlete obviously you want sure. you know, michael jordan to walk in and say i don't want to play basketball i want to play tennis that's sort of the idea behind my academy because I grew up in New York City to give, I, I'm biased, I admit. I think it's the greatest city in the world. I've had a lot of great experiences here, lived here my entire life. So I'd like to see the ultimate win-win for me would have this academy and someone come out of you know Manhattan or the Bronx or you know, Queens and win like a US Open. That would be like the ultimate for me. So it's a dream. Um, I did it. I grew up in Queens. I, you know, I had more advantages, you know, even my father who was a lawyer and eventually became a partner in a law firm early on needed scholarship money. So it's, you know, it's right. too expensive for most people. So we're trying to raise as much money as possible. 
So all you millions listening, please donate to the <laughs> Johnny Mac tennis prop. No, <laughs> no, it'd be great. You know, we're trying, we're trying to um, sort of change the thought process that goes into like making it because yeah. you know everyone thinks you gotta leave your house at ten or twelve and you gotta go to Nick Bolitari's in Florida and you gotta right. train eight hours a day when you're twelve. I just, me personally, I would have quit the game if I had had to do that. So I'd like to provide an alternative to kids. I went, I actually went to school, high school. I took the subway and the train every day to New York. It was like an hour each way. It was like a eye-opening experience. I think it kept it real for me in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, I made it to the semis of Wimbledon when I was 18 years old before I went to college, but I went to Stanford for a year. I was 21 in the world when I entered college. You know, the highest ranking since then to anyone's been like 600, you right, know, right. so... It was like most people were telling me not to do it, but I think the experience of going to college was helpful to me. Sort of give me time to mature. You saw how cool I was on the court when I met. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, you know, it, it helped in a number of ways. One is I like to be part of a team. You know, uh, you you spend your whole life being part of a team. I didn't. That outlet for me was really important as a kid you know to play basketball i played a couple of years of high school basketball uh i played four years of soccer in high school i think that's unusual so i would like to show the kids out there it can be done a different way you know they people convince them oh no no you, you got to specialize from back was yeah. back in the, the yeah. you know the dark ages you know you can't do that now but I, I i really don't think that's the case and you see probably there's been not the superstars, not yet Nadal or Federer or Djokovic, obviously. But there's been some top 10 players. Kevin Anderson went to college, got to four or five in the world. Isner hit 10. Um, this guy, Cam Norrie. There's a lot more kids coming out of college. And right. so that's, that's the thought behind my tennis academy. Um, we do spend more time indoors. It gets cold in New York. So what? You know? <laughs> right. Oh, or they, God forbid, played other sports a little bit. Don't you think that's good for their, I think, mentally and physically? When you played, obviously, people have an opinion, and, and, and you were pretty loud out there at times. And I, I could see myself in that, like a lot of emotions. But thinking yeah, back. Swedes are very emotional. Very, yeah. yeah. They're, they're not very guys total I played extroverts. With, you, know, you can tell exactly what Borg no, was but thinking. I, I want to know, <laughs> when did you play your best? Was it when you were calm and collected or when, the fact when you were emotional? And because for me, playing the game, that was like a fine balance where I try to be calm, but I need to be on edge a little bit to, to be a little aggressive. So to find that balance where you're not too aggressive, still calm. I, I felt like that was something ongoing that I had to work on. But do you remember when you were playing? Like, when did you play your best? I'm not sure I was ever calm. <laughs> <laughs> but I get your point is well taken. You don't want to be where you start, you know, uh, hurting yourself. And right. I think there's a point where you can push yourself at times and say you feel a little flat. You sort of just get something, you know, get it going, you know, in a way. You uh, sort of just get a little louder, I, I would say. Um, but generally, um, you always want to feel, believe it or not, to me, I was always under control. You know, I took it to the limit. I got defaulted once in 15 years on the tour because I, the, the rules changed, and I didn't at know the, the rules had Australian changed. Open. At the Australian Open. Yeah. Um, I was like, damn it, my, Sergio, this guy who was my manager, forgot to tell me <laughs> there was a rule change against Pernfors of another Swede. Um, so, um, but Sweet. I think that I had a pretty good idea of when to, you know, pull it back when necessary. Yep. But there were times where I felt like I sort of lost it and hurt me. And other times where, like when I played Borg, I didn't really need to do anything because if I did anything, it was magnified like five times because he never did anything. <laughs> I mean, you're like, just do something. <laughs> do something. I remember we played an exhibition <laughs> once where uh, me, it was me, Borg, Connors, and Gerolitis, my late buddy, Vitas Gerolitis. We were playing in Germany and I played Connors and then Vitas played Borg and they played a long rally. And at the end of the rally, uh, under his breath, you know, you could hear like a pin drop there. Borg missed a shot and goes, shit, right? <laughs> Vetus got down on his knees and looked up to the sky and the crowd gave him a standing ovation because you know, he showed some emotion. So like with him, I didn't need to do it. With Connors, we were so like, yeah. you know, two bulls in a China shop just sort of going at each other that it felt like, you know, you, whoever 
completely lost at first was the guy that might go down. But, you know, we were always pushing each other to sort of like lose it a little bit. But, you know, in certain ways that was very exciting. You, you talked about, I mean, the game has changed a lot. And you look at all sports and it's more intense. The players are, I think, well prepared to to take the next step the way they train but also the knowledge but you make it sound like uh, we, we didn't want to do that no <laughs> but it, it's just kids growing up today they have so much knowledge because they can watch it in a different way i remember when i started playing hockey i, I couldn't really watch it and mm -hmm. now you can watch highlights you can there's so much feedback constantly and and you can see the a lot of the kids they crave the feedback to get even better sure but i wanted to ask you what do you think are the ingredients to become a really good tennis player? Like, what, what do you need? Well, you need athleticism. And you need a spirit. And you need will, you know, ultimately. Because if most of the guys that are out there and girls playing are athletic, you know, some are superior to others. But then it gets down to, like, heart, you know, and who wants it more. Hmm. It's hard to teach that. You can sort of push people in the right direction if they listen. I didn't like looking at stats that much and you know, analytics and all the stuff that you hear about now. I think I get that some of that is OK, but I think it's swung too far in that other way, because at my academy, for example, every shot a kid hits, you know, they look like, what did I do? Right. Why don't you figure it out for yourself? You know, that's part of like the beauty of the sport of tennis mm -hmm. is that you need to think on your feet. But it's like that's to me the what. I try to teach more. It's like, yes, we can get to this. You know, like I coached Raonic uh, at the 2016 Wimbledon. I was working with him. I wasn't the only guy. And they look at these you know, analytics or odds uh, like uh, Murray, because he, he mm -hmm. had a beaten Federer in the semis and played Murray in the final, which was great. It's the best result he ever had. Oh, Murray likes to go cross court on the, you know, uh, back end return. Murray's, you know, one of the great players that play. If you just started doing that all the time, he would adjust. So I go like, you got to figure out, like, he's not going to do that. Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, that doesn't mean he can't do the other thing. So that's to me where that sort of part of the sport now yeah. in all sports is, is gone too far. Um, I mean, I would always love to see Sampras think, ah, oh, you know, it's, Nowadays, it's a better bounce at Wibble. These guys who would have, you know, these guys, I'm talking about those three guys. I'm not talking about these other guys. Oh, Djokovic, you know, greatest returner ever now. I'd like to see that hmm. on grass, even yeah. if the grass is firmer. Yeah. And it's like, you go to his back. Oh, because I, did you, t well, I don't know. It's different, in, I guess, when you're in a goalie. But like, to me, a lot of times you go, Oh, his best shots is forehand? Oh, okay. We're going to go for his forehand. <laughs> We're going to break right. it down. But, but right. Let's talk about the top three because I, I wonder about that. I, I'm a huge Roger Federer fan. I know you really enjoyed watching Roger and, and commentating on Roger for so many years. He's now out the door. You have Rafa and Djokovic left, but when they're out of the game, will tennis be in a good place? Well, well let me let me just answer that question with a thought. Uh, I remember back in my heyday, in 80 the mid 80s and i was so fed up with like the press i was getting at wimbledon and the bullshit they were saying in the press and all this other stuff now some of it was my fault but a lot of it wasn't and then i was with my ex-wife who was you know an actress and won an academy award at 10 years old and you know the two of us together was even more of this you know eruption to them and it really frustrated me to the point where in 1986 when my first son was born I was like, the hell with these people. I'm going to show Wimbledon who's boss. I'm not playing. And then I, you know, we'll see what happens. The whole sport's going to go to shit. You know, right? And then, then I, they're still playing. <laughs> and I doubled down. Next, I didn't, you know, I played 13 Wimbledons. I didn't play 15 because the next year I was like, all right, I'm going to show them again. Now, at that time, I had lost, my ranking had dipped a little bit, but yeah. I was still one of the favorites on grass. And I watched as, you know, Pat Cash won once. I mean, he's my buddy. I like him. And Boris Becker won for the second time. But I was like, hmm, not too good. Uh, you know, <laughs> they still play. So the point is, is that these guys are the three, in my opinion, the greatest players that have ever played for different reasons. But they're going to keep playing. This guy, Alcaraz, is electric. Is that the yeah. next one? Oh, without a question. This guy's amazing. I mean, yeah. if he stays healthy, I mean, he's 
it's like he looks so I've powerful. Never, I've never seen a guy. He's probably a half inch bigger than me, maybe six feet, half an inch. Yeah. That can do everything at, at that age, at 19. Now, these other guys could do a lot of things. You know, Nadal won, I think he was 19, I think, when he won the French the first of whatever it was, 13 or 14 times, which is insane. And Djokovic was 20, but I think Roger was 22. This guy's more advanced. But... The, of course there's going to be a huge void. You know, Roger, yeah. he was like the classiest guy that you'd ever meet and the most beautiful player I've ever watched. Nadal was the updated version of Connors to me. You know, I've never seen a guy try harder, like every point's the last point you're ever going to play. Hmm. How do you keep doing that? You know, 16, 18 years yeah. that you could care that much. And Djokovic is incredible. And mentally... He may be like, yeah, it's hard. You can make an argument for all three of them. Do you, like, do you, you think know, people yeah. have taken a little bit, like almost um, for granted what they've been doing? I, I, I try to think of other sports where you had three athletes dominate the way they've been dominating for the past 15 years. And it, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. I, I'm trying to come up with, or think about another sport we've, where you've seen this. Well, they psyched, right. they psyched uh, these other guys out, too. You know, these yeah. guys felt like bo bowling pins. I, I felt like at a certain point, like when I hit my peak in the mid-'80s, this is a cop-out, obviously, but it was like, wow, this is like I'm winning all these. You know, almost felt like it was too much, you know, yeah. in a way. And it was like, I'm not saying share the wealth, but you sort of maybe lose that edge a little bit. So I give them a lot of credit because I sort of sat back and was like, okay, you know, I'm a level above everyone. Let's wait and see what they got. Well, unfortunately, they caught up pretty quick and then <laughs> what, passed me. What was it? That was uh, 84. You I would say 84 is my best incredible. year. Incredible. Yeah, we're 84 and 80, 3. 82 and 3. Yeah. Um, and then the next year, I was sort of sitting back and, you know, I was with uh, and met my ex-wife. And, you know, I still was a match away from being number one again. I blew it at the Open. Uh, we had to play Saturday, Sunday those days. I played another damn Swede in the semis <laughs> that year, Matt's Vlander, And I went five sets in the heat. And then uh, Connors had sprained his ankle, so he couldn't really put up any fight against Lendl. So the next day, like, you know, I'm like, feel like I can barely <laughs> stretch past my knees. And, you know, like and, and everything changed then. It was, it was, it was frustrating. And, but, you know, what you have to do, what these guys have done a great job doing um, is to continue to try to improve. You got to not rest on your laurels. That was a, a mistake I made. And then when you play catch up and all of a sudden it's like Boris Becker comes along and you're like, I've never seen a guy at 17, 18 years old serve like that. How the hell is this guy mm. doing this? It was incredible. Biggest serve in the history of tennis. He was 18. I played him in Atlanta in an exhibition. Uh, we had played the once, I think once before that, but he had won Wimbledon. We played a big crowd. I'm like, I've never played anyone that serves bigger. And then three, four years later, I was finally sort of like in my head regrouping a little mentally. And I was like, okay, I got to win one more. You know, I'll try to win one more for the Gipper. I'm playing the U.S. Open. I make a run to the semis. Who am I playing? Some 19-year-old. I'm 31 now. Pete Sampras. Okay, I got this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, it didn't turn out that way. <laughs> Turned out he was pretty good. Yeah. So uh, that was uh, – that was an eye opener. So the, the the moral of the story is uh, to me is at least with these guys why I think they're so amazing is if you look at you know the course of their career they really did get better. It's arguable that they were their best in their thirties. Mm. What about what about in hockey, Hank? Like for you as as a young goaltender entering New York, you had probably Wah, Hasek, uh, and you thought like um, how did you how did you think the game would be? transferred from a goaltender perspective well thinking back of, of how much the game changed you have to be open to change your own game you, you can't think that when you arrive that's one thing but to stay there you constantly have to keep Always. pushing yourself and and adjust and um you know it's almost harder to stay there in it a is. way yeah. because then you, you then to yeah. get there yeah, so who is to it? get there. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think obviously when you do get there, the first year or so, you're so focused on, on staying. Sure. But then you realize, okay, I belong at this level. Now I need to really, you know, dig deep here yeah. to, to keep uh, adjusting my game because the game has 
really changed a lot. We talked about how tennis had changed. Hockey has changed a lot also over the last 15, 20 years. And they don't hit anymore. That, <laughs> well, I mean, I mean <laughs> also, but also when you look at, at goaltending, the technique, how the movements, if you go every five, 10 years, there's so many new moves that towards the end of my career, there were so many things going on that oh, I didn't grow up doing that. It was hard for me to adjust, but you try. You mm. try to s stay in that. Did, did you have, uh, you know, if, if uh, John had, had Pete, like, did you have somebody who came up later in your career that put you on notice or just from his technique? Yeah, the guy or... that's playing now. Right. <laughs> no. Supposedly he's good, right? Pretty good, yeah. No, I, I think throughout my career, there was always new guys coming into the league. Uh, but you don't want them on your team necessarily, <laughs> Yeah, right? but yeah. I, I think... Or did you, are you like, I, I embraced the competition. I'm like... Oh, let him embrace it later on. You know? <laughs> let me focus let me on myself. Finish this here. off here. I no. don't need this. Whoever this guy is from, I, I think because I didn't grow up with a lot of technique. It was a lot of heart, and it was a lot of figuring it out. But mm. now, guys that were you know five to ten years younger than me, they it was a different generation of more technique, more structure in the game. So you could see that coming into the league, you know five to eight years after I entered the league, it was way more structured. And and when you have a lot of structure, that's something you can fall back on when you're not playing your best. But there's a combination there where you can't yeah. just but rely that, on structure. Yeah, there's got to be a lot of heart too when you when you play I, your game. I, I did try to help the Rangers uh, many times, but one time in particular, um, I forgot. I know that it was Super Bowl day, I believe, uh, they played the next day and uh, the Red Wings came into town and Chris Chelios is an old buddy of mine. So I said, you got to come up and hang out at my apartment. So he goes, you mind if I bring uh, a couple friends? And I said, sure. You know, so he came with him and Nick Lidstrom, Dominic Hasek and Robert Lang. And these guys, we, and so I'm thinking, you know, they had to play, this was Super Bowl Sunday and they had to play the next day against the Rangers. We had a couple beers. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I, he's, as each one went down, I'm like thinking, hey, this is, I'm going to help out the Rangers, right? <laughs> and so the next day, I'm watching the beginning of the game, and I swear to God, Hasek looked like he was going to fall over. <laughs> <laughs> three goals in the first like five minutes. It was three nothing Rangers. I, I did my job, yeah. right? And apparently, he said, he, go, he brought Chelly over, and he goes, Chelly, I, 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 I fucked up, but I, I'm, I give up no more goals. And if you if you if the team scores for a four, we win. And then and they came back and won. <laughs> four, so, I, I, so all I can say is I tried. You uh, tried. Yeah, you did tried. your these, part. They, yeah. I did my part. These guys are tough. You know, they dug deep. You know, and we're talking about legends of hockey. Sure. Some of those guys there, like Chelly and Hashek. He's nuts. <laughs> They're all nuts. <laughs> yeah. Nick Lindstrom's one of the great defensemen that ever yeah. played. Another yeah. Swede. Another Swede. Another Swede. Another Swede's right? everywhere. Oh, uh, but, John, like now you... you um, doing an amazing job on TV and, and I'm, I'm dipping my toes into that world now, but it, when you work TV, is there a game plan there or, or are you just winging it? You have a feel for it, when to speak, not to speak because you're oh, so good at it. Yeah. Uh, I think that it, <laughs> I don't think there's a game plan, but I do think um, that you need to be yourself. Hmm. That's one thing that I think, whether or not you look at the camera, you know, it's like sometimes I hear camera left. You know, I'm like, I don't care where the camera is anymore. You know, I'll, we'll figure the camera should find you in a way. Yeah. And you should be, you know, you're part of a team, you know, which is yeah. sort of I like. But if hopefully if you have something to say, uh, people will understand you deserve that opportunity to say it. After all, I did play for a long time and hopefully I had some personality. So I got less worried about sort of, the technique of doing things right as we move from each camera and more about just sort of trying to be just feel like I don't do like a great deal of studying like in some sometimes I actually like when I see a guy I don't even know and I sort of think about it the way I would do if I played him you know like try to figure him out like mm. let's say we didn't have the opportunity to get all these notes you know he's coached by uh so and so from Sweden. I talked to his coach, and he said that he likes to hit his forehand. You know, I no one cares. But do you watch a lot of tennis? I do watch a lot of tennis. Do yeah. so you mean, stay updated on what's going on? I stay on. updated. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, yeah. I I think that's the main thing that I do. So you know, we have a tennis channel. Hopefully, it'll hang around for a while. Um, but that allows 
any of us that love the sport and sp especially someone who's working in the sport to get a feel for what's happening out there and actually see it. Mm -hmm. You know, I can go watch the tournament that's in Houston this week. It's a little ink rinky dink tournament, but you don't miss someone in case someone's coming along or if I love to see that because it's, I don't want the same old, same old. I'd like to see something different. And then you, obviously you go to the majors, which is really where I focus my attention. I think it's better for me because, you know, I traveled a lot for a long time. Uh, that's that's work for me. Yeah. What tournament is your favorite to work? Uh, my favorite to work are the same two that are my favorite to play. You know, the U.S. Open, I grew up 15 minutes from where they played the tournament. I ball boyed when I was a kid at the U.S. Open when I was at Forest Hills. Um, I have a lot of history there. I've been commentating for 30 years. Played, obviously. And then the other is Wimbledon because yeah. it's sort of like, well, I forgot, like Augusta, you know, some of the Masters. It's sure. just like this. And as a kid growing up, I remember I was looking and you see the grass the first couple of days. It's beautiful. You're like, wow, that's so beautiful. And then one of the first times I really watched, Bjorn Borg was playing. And I was watching the match and, you know, he was pretty young then. He, this is before he won it, but it was, you know, he was getting there quick. And he won a match and he goes up and suddenly you'd see all these people run on the court and like run up to him. And then outside the locker room, there was like, a couple hundred young girls screaming like yeah! and i'm like i want to be a tennis player <laughs> or i want to be a swede i, I, want, to be, I want either one yeah. but something there is very appealing um you know because i couldn't believe it was like the closest thing i don't know if i ever seen it in tennis before i haven't actually like the beatles almost i'm mm. not going to say it was like but for us that was the equivalent because people were going absolutely crazy like he'd just do just stand there and i was like well, maybe I'll grow my hair longer, see if that works. <laughs> <laughs> I remember uh, a few years ago, I brought a friend to Wimbledon, and we were hanging out, we were chatting to, to Federer during the day, we were watching play, and then at night I met up with you, had a few beers, mm -hmm. and my buddy looked at me that night, he's like, you know what, I, I can't come back here now. <laughs> I watched Roger, I, I talked to Roger, we're having beers with Macro. I can't go back to Wimbledon. But, I mean, it's such a great tournament. Uh, and, and you compare it to the U.S. Open, I feel like U.S. Open is amazing. It's a party. Wimbledon is, is very a lot of history and classy, but both of them just a great well, you, experience. You, you, yeah, U.S. Open was the first they had night matches. You know, so people, you know, had, had a couple, you know, could get back from work, relax a little, pop up a few, and then all of a sudden the energy would be absolutely insane. So that was very, very cool. Wimbledon's like, right <laughs> proper that's why it was so weird the first year i went there i'm like what's with these people man? yeah <laughs> they're so polite <laughs> this isn't yeah. the way it is in new york yeah. we're yelling and screaming get out of my way you know all of a sudden they, and then they're like god that kid is weird I'll go, you're weird okay yeah so there was a we we had some struggles for a while yeah ahead of your time though that was that's the perfect that's what today's media wants is that juxtaposition between proper and I'm, I'm an authentic guy here competing i guess i don't I know. know you know what who cares what the press wants yeah. i mean in a way they just want to sell papers and use right. you pretty much right you know yeah. it's like so you know i'm not that enamored especially like early on you know i've sort of accepted and try to I fly under the radar a little bit you know to me i don't want you know that other stuff that's a lot a lot that's a lot going on i mean it, Certain people like that, you know. Um, you know, some people have this ability, which, which I don't have. You know, I feel like it's like, oh my God, you're always like, please, you know, <laughs> be, be nice, be nice. Uh, so uh, that's 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 an ex that's partially why I never got into politics mm -hmm. because it's too win. You think sports is competitive? It's well, crazy. Let, let's uh, shift gears into music a little bit. The first time I met you, I think. If I'm not mistaken, was at a Bruce Springsteen concert in Jersey, yeah. actually. And we started talking about sports, we talked about music, and we actually said, let's let's get together and jam yeah. a little bit. So we did. And we we've had a, a couple of charity gigs and mm -hmm. it, it's been awesome. Uh but where is that music interest coming from? Has it always been there or I always like music, but yeah. um, I didn't really start playing until I went on the road because you we, you're killing a lot of time. 
Um, and so you're sitting around your hotel room for God knows how many hours a day. I said, well, it's not a bad idea. Why don't we start, you know, playing? Because I was like playing air guitar or like a guitar <laughs> with a tennis racket, <laughs> you know, to Black Sabbath or Led Zeppelin when I was a kid growing up. So then I started playing on the tour and I got my first guitar. It was a Gibson Les Paul and I was like, these guitars are heavy. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really pick up the other ones. You know, I'm lefty, so there's only out of a hundred guitars that is guitar, so there's one lefty. Not a lot of choices. So I picked this one up, went to Chicago for an event. Soon after I just started playing, I had a room the size of a house. I mean, this is one of the biggest rooms I ever I don't know why I had this thing, but Maybe it was because it was a hotel close to the airport. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I went and saw a buddy guy who's this famous blues musician. Yeah. So I go see him at this club. He used to have a, a buddy guy's his club. And uh, I went with an ex-football player buddy of mine, Gary Fensick. And we went to this club. And buddy guy put on a show. I mean, the guy was, you know, he was outside playing while the band was playing. I mean, he He's was like, amazing. So, yeah. I was like, why am I bothering, you know, playing guitar? So I went back to my, I smashed the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Just smashed it. I go, Freak, what am I wasting my time for? <laughs> so for a period of time, and, and, and you probably know this from playing guitar. It does take some energy and focus. Like it, you know, you sort but, of feel like, are you going to waste that energy for what you're doing? But different. It's Still, a different yeah, thing. But you, you, you when you to... play guitar, the, the, you know, when you're playing a game, before well, the game to, to me playing guitar is like it's relaxing because i still need to pay attention to what i'm doing but i'm i'm getting a break from hockey and everything else going on in my life it's kind of like watching a really good movie where you just it's you you're playing and yeah you need some sort of focus there but it's still a very very relaxing feeling but that makes me think of relaxing <laughs> feeling. Being on stage sometimes is not that relaxing. I saw you in London. Was it last year with Pearl Jam? Yeah. Sixty-five thousand yeah. people. Were you relaxed? Awesome. No, no, not at all. But you know, they also have two, three guitar players. Yeah, okay. You know, I could lay a total leg and it wouldn't matter. <laughs> I'm like, am I turned on? <laughs> you know. Um, but that was awesome. I, I that happened twice in two weeks because my wife. Uh, was in, you know, the band Scandal in the 80s, Patti Smythe, and she's had like, you know, five top five hits mm. and sold millions of records. She's, she says, the way I play guitar is I wrestle it into submission. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that's a compliment. Wow. But she did a number one song with Don Henley, who's the lead singer in the Eagles. So last sure. year when we went, it was his birthday, or her birthday actually, and the Eagles were playing, and he says, why don't you come play Already Gone? And I'm like, Okay. Wow. You know, so that was like in the same thing. And then two weeks later, uh, Pearl Jam's playing and I'm sitting there going, uh, oh, you know, it's lockdown still. The Pearl Jam's on lockdown. And so I'm like, you got to wear a mask and get tested. And I had the matches. I missed the stones because I was working. Um, and that's like a legendary place to see music. But and Pearl Jam. Is I get there finally, it's a little late, and I'm wearing this mask, and all of a sudden I see Eddie, I, th I think he sees me, uh-oh, you know, and then it's like, oh, he's just say, you ready to play? You know, like, <laughs> the, oh, God. Patty's not really giving you any tricks, and, and she's like, you know, she's she, letting you do your thing, but that's about it. She stays very far away. <laughs> <laughs> I've funny. got my son-in-law recently, I just played a show a couple of days ago down in, uh, before the pickleball. We played in the Hard Rock. That's oh, a cool. tough show when there's people like, yeah. Uh, Drinking. Can I get another yeah. burger, please? You know, you're like, um, <laughs> that's maybe a true this test. wasn't the best spot. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, music, uh, but you're also uh, very big into art, right? Yeah. You uh, love art. Uh, well, I think I, I, I can relate to artists like a lot because they're sort of on their own. You know, they remind me the three jobs that I look at are the most similar tennis. Uh, an artist and a comedian, you know, a stand-up comedian, because yeah. you're out there, you could, you know, you suck, <laughs> you know, they're like, <laughs> right. thank you. Um, or you go into an art gallery, new show, oh, that's the worst show I ever saw in my life, yeah. you know, and you know, oh, thanks a lot, I just put six months of my life into that. <laughs> and then some guy screaming at me on the tennis court, you get him out of here, you stupid <laughs> jerk. You know, I'm not supposed to go, oh, that's okay, don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> 
that's what I, surprised me actually with people. It's like some guy's gonna call me in total asshole, and I'm supposed to go, hey, thank you, <laughs> thank you so I much, go, fuck you too, <laughs> yeah. man. Yeah, actually, that's sort of what I did. But uh, the bottom line is that uh, those are my two great loves because I think, um, I, I mean, sports is my true love. You use that side of your brain, sort of that competitive side. Yeah. Whether it's when we went as kids on the pond to play a little hockey or play bass, all these other sports, you know, I played them all. But that other side, that sort of more cerebral side, that I didn't do any of that as a kid. I never mm -hmm. went to an art museum. My parents never took me to a movie. They'd always take me around to, you know, play tennis. And so I was like, can we uh, take a break one, right. once in a while from this tennis thing? But it worked out. Yeah. So I got to look at the bright side. But, uh, I was a little late to the party, maybe. So that's why I, I think I appreciate it more. My late buddy, Vitas Garolitis, was the guy that started taking me down to Soho, which was sort of the epicenter, in a way, at that time of the art scene. Probably still allowed to play music back then. I'm sure you could. Yeah, you know, there was a lot of people playing, you know. That was the legendary days of CBGBs, you know, go sure. see the Talking Heads and the was, Ramones, all these what bands. What was the first uh, piece you bought that you First Remember? piece I bought, I believe, was a photorealistic piece. It was like photorealism. I was like, oh, my God, it looks exactly like it would look in a photograph. Um, you live and learn and advance mm. to different things. I mean, I've tried to be open to everything just because sure. there's so many great things you can look at, whether it's a piece of sculpture, whether it's abstract. I didn't get abstract for a long time. Mm. I'm not sure I totally get it now. You just always get a female nude, you know. I could always look at a female nude. You know, male nudes tougher to resell. You know, <laughs> say so. There's certain criteria, but a lot keeps changing. Um, photo real realism had his moment. Um, you had all types of different art all through the decades. I mean, Basquiat was. Uh, I never met him. I did go once with Steve Rubell, who owns Studio Fifty Four, to I believe it was palladium or xenon the next place he was opening and in the place while we were walking he was showing me the place as it was about to open basquiat like kenny scharf keith herring and uh clemente another artist were painting away like he had a he you know give you a couple grand to paint the bathroom or something right and you didn't realize how like wow i mean it turns out basquiat's like you know Rafael Nadal or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah, he, some of it perhaps is because he died, unfortunately, so young. But I got, I got an opportunity because of tennis to sort of meet a lot of people, get to go to a lot of studios if I wanted to, just see things that I wouldn't maybe normally have the opportunity to, to see otherwise. And that made me appreciate it that much more. And the music was like the ultimate, though, because, you know, I mean, like, Robert Plant or whatever, you know, like Led Zeppelin is my favorite band. You know, I'm sitting there and he's like, oh, great, Mike. You know, it's, yeah. Love watching you, Wimbledon, you know, sort of buttering me. I'm like, what? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then, you know, in the mid 80s, there was a period of time where um, they were saying, ah, oh, Mac and I suspend him for a year. You know, these old farts in the tennis federation, yeah, he's bad for tennis, whatever. And I go to like a party whether it was like a quote unquote Hollywood party or something like that, you know, and I meet not to drop names, but, um, you know, I'd be a Mick Jagger. Mm. Don't change a thing. <laughs> right. Jack Nicholson. Don't change a thing. Who am I going to listen to? Those two <laughs> or some old fart that works for the U S tennis association, you know, come on. Totally. Uh, but I mean, you, you've seen so much in the city. You grew up in the city. You experienced so much on and off the court, meeting people, and you talk about music and art, and it's like, what does New York City mean to you? Oh, I mean, it means, um, it's, it's the reason that I believe I am who I am. You know, I've been lucky, uh, because I think I've done a hopefully a reasonably good job of navigating the more the positives and the negatives. I wasn't like an all night guy necessarily. I wasn't, I, of course I went to Studio 54. You know, I used to go there, there'd be hundreds of people online to get in and you'd try to get, 
hey, uh, it's John, I'm, you know, five in the world. Hey, get the hell out of here, you know? <laughs> so in a way, you know, that made me more of who I, because I was like, man, I got to get to two or three or one or something. <laughs> I, I can't even get in. Or, or I got to have a personality like Vetus. They'd op- it was like the red carpet just opened the door for him. Like, Vetus, are you going to uh, Studio 54 soon? Uh, <laughs> you know? I mean, I was more like a rock guy. You know, I preferred that part of it. But growing up in just sort of, um, you know, I lived in Queens, but I sort of lived in a suburb. So I wasn't really, the goal was always to get, to, to me, the city's like Manhattan. I know it's spread a bit. Brooklyn's become more hip. You know, it's like Queens and Brooklyn. They didn't exactly mix a whole, you weren't going to Brooklyn a whole lot. So I think that I, because I went to high school in Manhattan and started to experience it more and more, it's like an addiction. Mm-hmm. You know, and like the first concert I ever went to was at Madison Square Garden. I went to see Grand Funk Railroad. Um, not that that's like some major band. I saw Led Zeppelin at Madison Square Garden. You know, I went to Ranger games, not often because, you know, we couldn't afford to go that much, but we went a few times. The Knicks, you know, the Knicks won, you know, the NBA title when I was 10. Hey, and then a couple of years later, t- uh, twice in like a three year, this is going to happen a lot. <laughs> the Rangers, you know, I was, uh, when I was 20, I knew like two thirds of the Rangers of the year they lost to the finals to the Canadians. I was in Toronto, Toronto, Tokyo, flew back from Tokyo, had this exhibition, went straight from the airport to the garden for like game five that I think they lost in overtime. But I knew all those guys. We went out all the time. And so, um, that was the time where they were encouraging, you know, was sort of the Rangers to live in the city. Mm-hmm. Hey, that's a good idea. Well, some of them took it a little too far. <laughs> <laughs> that's weird. <laughs> and, you know, I, I'd be around, you know, okay, you know, and I don't want to be part of hurting the Rangers. I want to hurt the opponent like I tried with the Red Wings. But uh, those were like great times, it felt like, in the city. Because the city was a little, in the 70s, it was a little rough, you know. It was, mm-hmm. the, you know, it was going through some tough times, but... It sort of just felt like the timing just was so beautiful and it was just so I was so I, I was proud to sort of feel like I was representing in a way. I yeah, gotta say. To, to me you feel very New York with all your interests and what you're up to. And in the fall, I last fall I, I saw you out in California, a beautiful house on the ocean mm-hmm. and, and but will you ever be there full time or New York will always be part of your No, oh, it's gotta be always part of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if I could live anywhere full time, you know. Um, it's great to have a mix a little bit, a um, little yin and yang. Yeah. Um, but if I had to, I could easily live in New York. I mean, it's, you know, there's a lifestyle that's easier. As you get older, you don't need quite as much, you know, <laughs> chaos, perhaps. You know, it's yeah. nice to, you know, I had six kids. I've tried to, you know, you want to maintain a hopefully a good relationship. I had my first grandkid like a month ago or Congrats. so. Yeah, thank you. I think. Um, yeah, it was like, I'm getting old, man. But, um, but no. And also because of the pandemic, I mean, it was a little, it was weird here. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it was, I, it was in all the cities, but particularly New York. Cause to me, if like New York's not cooking, our country's not going to be cooking. I mean, I, maybe I'm biased, but you can't have like New York going down the tubes or whatever. Oh, but I was going to the garden the other day. Uh, we we're going for dinner first. It was a beautiful day out. Uh, and, Soho was on fire. Yeah, there was people everywhere. It makes me so happy every time I see the city energized, people happy, being out and and just having a great time. And then go to the garden I, that night. It was uh, Bruce Springsteen playing, but it was just. What about you though? Would you ever uh, consider like going back to? I, I don't know if it's even a possible. You know, going back to Sweden more like easy life as opposed to New York. I, I think. Uh, I like it here. My my wife Therese loves it here. Kids love it here. So I feel like this is home now. We we go back to Sweden every summer. Yeah. And uh I think that's an important time to kind of get the contrast in life too. It's slower, it's more relaxed, and then you come back here as a kid at Christmas in uh, late August. Um I just love coming back. Being away for for a few weeks or a month and then you come back to the city is always a great feeling. Um I don't know. I don't look too far. Uh, but right now, New York is definitely the place to be for me and, and the family. Well, listen, really appreciate 
you coming on the show talking about Toximukia. Ah, yeah. Toximukia. That that I know that and a couple bad words, but I in Swedish, yeah. It's yeah. Swedish. Yeah, thanks to No, we really appreciate it, man. Yeah, thanks, John. You're a busy man, it but it's no, great no. to yeah, see you great. always. Awesome. And uh let's plan another jam session for sure. And let's get on the court too, because you're playing again, right? I'm back. I'm Beautiful. back playing. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, we're all grateful for that. The best players that I ever had uh, right now, I'm going to say, I think was uh, Henrik on the tennis court. Yeah. Other athletes. Henrik, uh, Steve Nash plays pretty good. Is he good? Yeah. You sh you guys should go out. I heard rumors about that up at Randall's that he, My he's old, a very good yeah, player. Yeah, he is. He's up at Randall's. He's come out a bunch of times. So yeah. I'd love to see you two guys go at it. All see right. You, two competitors, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> You gotta make that happen. I know he's a great soccer player too. I could. He is. I yeah. did play soccer. Did some yeah. soccer thing with yeah. him. He's great in soccer. And so uh, that, you know, I'm thinking that's. Oh, we'll, we'll play double. I'll get my brother. We'll play uh, me and you against Nash McEnroe. Love it. Sold. <laughs> Love Sold. it. <laughs> Love it. Well, thanks again. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks really for having me. Thank no you. No worries. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with John. Um, a lot of fun stories. I, I couldn't stop laughing a few times there, but you know, it, it's, it's just great to hear uh, some of the old stories and, and his perspective on tennis today and where it was and where it's going. To be honest, I thought he was going to put us both out of a job because we didn't really have to do much in this one. <laughs> he's a, he's a, he's a powerhouse, you know, and uh, I, I hope the audience and our club 30 members felt the same way. That was tons of energy um if you did like the show we would love to have you guys out there as club members so please subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts see you guys